Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Hey. Got peeps shuffling in. Getting ready to talk virtuous strategies, responsive fundraising strategies. I love it. It is one of our favorite things to talk about. <laughs> it's almost like it's what we do, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Happy Thursday, everybody. We'll get going in just a minute. Welcome to the Virtuous Insider. We meet every Thursday. Today, we are talking about strategies and actions. We're really kind of laying out some fundraising strategies, some responsive strategies, and um, tying that in into some kind of actionable pieces, looking at uh, Virtuous as an actual database. We'll jump in and, and do some kind of real things in a little bit after we chat for a bit. Oh, Megan, you're just rubbing it in. Rainy <laughs> in Chicago. It is. It's only like a bajillion degrees here in Arizona. My apologies, Arizonans. Oh, Megan, Megan. That was tactless. That was savage. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we got a good crew here. So we'll go ahead and get started for today. Um, welcome. Like we said, this is the Virtuous Insider. We meet every Thursday. This is our strategies and actions session. Um, and so I will go ahead. First things first, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are recording today's presentation. Um, it's going to be available in the Virtuous Support Center once we're done, probably about first thing tomorrow. We have everybody muted except for Megan and I. Um, so if you do have a question, feel free to use the Q&A feature in Zoom. You can submit a question. We'll answer it there. Or if you just had a thought or uh, something you wanted to add into the chat, feel free. Uh, we'd love to have some participation here, but welcome everybody. My name is Stephanie Larson. I am a product trainer here at Virtuous, and I am joined by the wonderful, magnificent Megan, uh, who's part of the Virtuous team as well. And so we are doing a, um, a kind of skewed Megan and, Megan and Stephanie show today, mm -hmm. where we're really going to be talking about some kind of actionable pieces from the Responsive Weekly and taking a look in Virtuous uh, for some action kind of items. So Megan, how are you doing? You said it's rainy in Chicago. It and is. Getting we're getting a nice little summer rainstorm going. Uh, and it's great to be here. I see some regulars from the Responsive Weekly. So some of you will be familiar with some of the things we're talking about, but also some names I don't know. So that's always great to meet more customers. And so, Megan, you said some regulars from the Responsive Weekly. So if we have anybody that, you know, has participated in some conversations on the Responsive Weekly, please feel free to chime in with your thoughts or kind of takeaways or, you know, Megan and I are going to be chatting a little bit about kind of some of our thoughts, but we'd love to hear from you guys. So uh, feel free. You can always jump in, okay? Wonderful. But for Megan, the folks that don't know, can you tell us really quickly what the Responsive Weekly is? What does that mean when we're talking about that? Sure. The Responsive Weekly is a community here at Virtuous um, made up of nonprofit professionals from all over the place. Some of them are using Virtuous, some of them don't. But what they have in common is a commitment and interest in responsive fundraising. So every Tuesday, I send those folks an email introducing our topic of the week with some resources and things to check out to kind of get the discussion going. And then every Thursday at noon Eastern, we meet for half an hour on Zoom, usually joined um, by a special guest, and we discuss the topic and see what we can learn. So for instance, today we were talking with Cindy Fallon about the board chair and executive director relationship and ways to strengthen it. It was super fun. Um, we've been talking a lot about donor retention lately. And it's a really great opportunity to kind of bounce ideas off people who have, they have the idea of responsive fundraising in common with you, but they're not within your organization. So you can get a broader perspective and really have those peer conversations, whether you're the lone fundraiser at your organization or part of a larger team. So we do that every week and everyone's welcome. I'll put the subscription link in the chat. Awesome. You can have a, yeah virtuous touch point a few different times throughout the week. Um, but 
Megan is the host and kind of team leader and I'll call her queen of all things, the responsive weekly. <laughs> um, and so she is, you know, part of that conversation. She's kind of putting together some of those topics and, and facilitating some of that um, kind of interaction with everybody. And so today we really want to kind of take a quick look at um, really some kind of actionable pieces from the responsive weekly. So talking through some highlights um, and really some kind of strategy tips and things like that from the responsive weekly. So we're going to talk a little bit today about new donor acquisition and some tips for a responsive kind of mindset. Um, and then we're going to actually pop into Virtuous and take a look at uh, one of our workflow automations, the new donor welcome series. Um, and then if anybody has any kind of questions, we'll, we'll take them on from there. So sound good? Sure sounds good to me. Awesome. Okay, Megan, take it away. Let us know a little bit about kind of some of the highlights in regards to donor acquisition. Absolutely. So we did something new on the weekly this month, uh, which was we had what our guest Chris Barlow called a quest storm, a question brainstorm around new donor acquisition. And so what we really were looking at is just as much as figuring out how do you find new donors, which is always the, the question, right? Like, where are they? Who are they? How do I get them? We started looking at what are the questions you should be asking before any new donor acquisition effort? So it was great because everyone contributed um, things that they thought of, things that they wish they'd asked before. These questions like, who are the donors we're trying to target? Where are they already? What kind of efforts are we going to do? And then one of the things that really came out that I think was a good takeaway applicable across all kinds of new efforts, which is really asking, what does it take to do this? Whatever you're planning. And making sure that you're accounting for all of the things it might take, not just budget. Because there's this, I don't know if we call it a trend or a habit, but I don't think it's unusual in nonprofit circles to like, we definitely look at what things cost in money, but we don't necessarily look at what it costs in time, particularly staff time or effort. Mm -hmm. So we were asking questions around that of like, what are the kinds of new donor acquisition activities that we could do and what would it take to do them and what kind of platform support would we need to do them? How much work was we would really be involved? What are we really getting into? So that was, I think, a great approach to the topic and it was one I hadn't thought of before. So I really enjoyed diving into it of asking those questions before you jump off into like, we got to get some new donors, we got to find them somewhere and getting very targeted and very deliberate about these are the things we're going to do. These are the things we're not going to do. Here's who we're trying to reach. These are the channels we're going to try it on. Here's what we actually have the bandwidth for. So it was kind of a different take on it. And I think it was um, really enlightening to see the different perspectives. So I encourage everyone um, to check out the archive for that session because it was a lot of great questions that might help you shape your thinking around new donor acquisition. So in that case, it was kind of a higher level conversation, which is also true about our responsive mindset converse conversation with Beth Fisher. So this question month. for you, Megan, mm -hmm. in regards to, um, you know, really how everyone was kind of contributing as far as things they're going to do, you know, we always think about things like that, like what's possible, what can we do, you know, we rarely tend to think about the limitations, I think, at least I, you know, I'm one of those people, I like to see the glass half full, mm -hmm. but I never really thought about, you know, coming at it in the sense of what are we not going to do? What things are we going to eliminate or avoid um, that might be costly as far as financial or time or energies even? So was there anything just off the top of your head, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, anything that kind of came out as a group of, of something that folks are not doing? Not anything in particular, but I think that is just asking the question is very important. And I think asking that question as a team and identifying, we talk about this a lot um, as far as just planning your fundraising or creating a fundraising plan and being strategic of really naming the things you're not going to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, we're not acquiring people from say, paid lists 
we're not renting lists of new contacts. If you say that, and I'm not endorsing that or rejecting it as a strategy, I'm just giving it as an example. If you say that, then you can quit having the discussion about it. I love that. Right. So you can say, these are the things we're not doing. Asking, oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. If you know, like, these are things we're not doing, then you don't have those miscommunications on your team when it's time to like order the list, right? Or do the event that you decided not to do. If you can clearly communicate, these are acquisition activities that might be good for some time or might be good for some organization, but they're not what we're doing right now. You have greater clarity and can spend more time instead of diffusing misunderstandings or working at odds against each other, you can work together on the things that you're focused on. I love that. It's like almost like asking a reverse question. It's not something I would have thought of. So sorry, I had to just know. (laughs) Oh no, absolutely. Yeah. So we definitely got into like theory this month on the, or a higher level um, discussion on the responsive weekly, because we were also joined by Beth Fisher, who is putting together a series of videos that'll be out pretty soon uh, for Virtuous called the responsive mindset. And Beth is, a, I don't think she's here today, but she is um, a fundraising leader. She's the chief advancement officer at Mel Trotter Ministries, which is an organization addressing homeless, homelessness. And what she just kind of told us her story of coming in from a for-profit background with a big focus on um, processes and efficiency and things like that and how she came into fundraising and the ways that she's become responsive in order to make fundraising, yes, more efficient, but also more personal and human. So she's doing a whole series of videos on this very topic. And so we'll make sure we alert you to them when they come out. Um, But we had just a discussion about what is relationship-based responsive fundraising and what are some steps you can take at your organization to make that transition? And how do you, um, one of the things I think will be very useful for people if they check that, that out is that sometimes like you're the person in the organization who has the vision, right? And then you need to find ways to be like, cool, now how do I bring everything? How do we all get on the same page about this? How do we, which legacy systems do we not use anymore? How are we communicating with donors now? What are those bits and pieces and steps? And one of the things that we did talk about will get us right into our strategies, I think, uh, are things like communication series, like a new donor welcome series of putting in pieces of communication and connection where donors have the opportunity to talk back to you, to talk with you, to share their own passions and motivations and to offer points of connection all along their journey. So that was definitely an important takeaway of finding ways to really prioritize relationships with donors every step of the way. I love that. I love that. And it's, again, it's, it's that kind of maintaining once you get someone, how do you keep Mm -hmm. them getting them the first kind of inner or getting to like the first interaction is one thing, but getting to that second interaction, regardless of if it's a, a, you know, a gift or not, but just that second touch point, if you will. Um, I think that's the hardest part. And that's, that's Mm -hmm. the the part that makes the biggest difference. Um, but is the easiest kind of dropped, if you will. Right. And it is tricky because we know that if we can get new donors to their second gift, After that, they're much more likely to be engaged. But those first time givers, we know like sadly, statistically, they are much more likely not to give again. Mm -hmm. Like we lose most of those. But when you start approaching it from, instead of a cycle of, we find people, they give, they go away. We have to find new people. We have to find new people. They give, they go away. We find new people over and over and over on that hamster wheel and start looking at, okay, how are we going to make this meaningful? How are we delivering on the promise that the donor was intrigued by at the beginning, which is why they gave, there was something that was interesting to them, something that they cared about. And how do we keep making those connections? And a new donor welcome series is a great way to do that because it gets them right at that first gift. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. And so I want to pop into Virtuous and take a peek at the new donor welcome series. Um, but even as you were saying that, Megan, I actually was thinking of another uh, workflow that we have in Virtuous. Um, you guys all know we've got our, our best practice uh, templates in uh, Virtuous Automation. And one of those is actually our donor retention. Um, and so you got me all excited, Megan. So I want to talk about that one as well. So bear with me just a second. If you had any other thoughts, please go ahead. I'm just going to go ahead and hop over to Virtuous uh, proper. So bear with me just a second. Right. I think the two things do go very, very closely together, right? Because retention almost begins at acquisition. Like as soon as a donor is acquired, we want to start working to retain them because that's just relationship building. So I'm interested if anyone who's on the call today is using a new donor welcome series or uh, the retention series or workflow rather. Um, and if so, how it's going. Yeah, I'd love that. If you're seeing any These results, are... we'd love to hear about that. Um, so or if I'm you're making... just setting it up. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> you can go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I'm in uh, marketing Oh gosh, I can't even talk today. I'm in Virtuous in our marketing automation um, kind of module, if you will. And we were just talking about uh, the new donor welcome series, which we, again, we have a kind of preset um, template for you that has some of our kind of findings here at Virtuous that just kind of structures it. So it's, it's a place to start. You don't have to start from scratch. But then we also have a donor retention uh, workflow. So I want to actually pop into donor retention really quick, uh, go a little bit backwards here, because donor retention is, like you said, Megan, you work so hard to get a donor. How do you keep them? How do you stop them from going away um, <laughs> once you've gotten them? You've, you've done all that work on the front end. The welcome series, all the touch points, they've gotten a second gift, what have you? How do you stop them from going away? So I happen to have uh, one of those ones pulled up. So let me go ahead and just pop on over really quick. So the donor retention workflow, it's, it's a slightly kind of different look if you are familiar with our new donor uh, workflow, but our new donor welcome series, excuse me, too many W sounds. Uh, the donor retention is kind of a fun one, and I was thinking about it because I realized a lot of people might not realize this one little kind of tip or trick, if you will, but in any of our uh, workflow templates, if there's an email action, so remember these columns are steps and these rows are actions, so if any of these actions are emails, you'll see the little note from Virtuous saying, hey, this email hasn't been published because Again, I'm, I just opened a new template, so I gotta, I gotta make it my own. Virtuous is really just kind of putting the bones of this workflow together, saying this is a, a, a kind of proven successful structure, make it your own now. But I don't know if you guys realize, if you actually open up any of the kind of template, not template emails, but the, um, oh gosh, I cannot talk today, the little workflow emails, in the emails themselves, if you've ever taken the time to read them, we actually have populated a little bit of some suggestions in here. What type of messaging could be helpful for an email like this? Communicating that you haven't heard from them in a while, their support is needed, including a call to action, a few little tips and tricks. So it's just, it, I'll be honest, I don't often read, you know, template, uh, words and things like that. It's normally just kind of gobbledygook, but we've actually put in some tips and tricks inside the actual template emails. So just wanted to point that out. But once you've gotten that donor and you've, you've gone through the, you know, welcome series, they're engaged, a period of time passes and, you know, perhaps they become disengaged. So this is kind of a fun workflow because it is very kind of simply structured, if you will. You either have someone that is pre-lapsed, so they're going um, in the direction of becoming a lapsed donor, and pre-lapsed is a system uh, tag in Virtuous that means if they have not given a gift in the last six months, we automatically give them that pre-lapsed tag. 
So this is a really easy one to get going because it's a very simple structure. Prelapsed means they've got that tag. And if they have that tag, that means they haven't given in the last six months. These folks are at risk of becoming lapsed donors. So this is a really easy one to set up. And it really is just structured to just kind of remind them of your message, give them that personal touch point and share some additional kind of comments based on things you know about them. So based on listening to, you know, when they were active and, and engaged in giving, what did we learn about them? What connections did we make? What can we pull in to these conversations to remind them that we appreciate them and that, you know, they've made a difference and we don't want them to go away. So this is just a really easy one because again, two steps, a whole host of actions, but the criteria is very simple. Somebody's not given in a few months or someone is past due on an expected you know, payment or, or pledge payment or something like that. So I digress because that was a, a longer than I wanted to chat about the <laughs> retention workflow, but it does make a difference if you're going to put all the work up front for a new donor and their welcome series, you know, how do you, I, I can't talk and scroll apparently, um, how do you keep them? So I want to have create, a question about oh, personalizing those emails. Tell me one more time. I'm so sorry. Oh, we had a question about personalizing those emails. Tiffany's asking uh, if they're supposed to be generic or if you can add in personal inf in information before you send it. So as far as automations go, remember you're setting up this email to be sent out whenever someone hits that action within that step. So workflow is running every single day. So you can have someone at every step and at every action, everybody's kind of on their own journey. You're just keeping the pace moving along with things like the delays and stuff. Mm -hmm. So anytime you have an email attributed to a workflow, it's going to be that email. The only kind of personalization piece as far as individual emails going out are going to be these merge tags where Virtuous will pull in things like you know, dear Megan, if it's going to Megan, dear Stephanie, if it's going to Stephanie. And we've got a whole host of merge tags that you can utilize. That's just an example of one. But the email content stays the same because it's consistently going out. You do always have the ability where you can pause the whole workflow or make a change to an email and republish it. So you're kind of refreshing that copy, but it's going to be going out consistently. Because it could, you could send one today, you could send 10 tomorrow, just depending on how many donors are in each step or each action. If you're wanting to do an email that is extremely specific to a, to a donor, one of the options that you can always do in automations, and let me actually just pull one up. Um, it might be. Uh, what Tiffany has said is her workaround on that too, or not even a workaround, but her solution is to use the task with the automated with email the automation to send to send a custom one. Yes, that's the perfect way to do it. Because again, when you're setting up an automated uh, or an email in automation, you're not controlling when that's going. You're controlling the pace at which someone's moving through that workflow. So that email could be sent every single day. So you can absolutely pause it and make some changes. So it's, you know, change for the next day, but you're not changing it per person. Using the merge tags does that to a, to a degree, but if you're utilizing an action that is the task, Tiffany's already on it, you can utilize a personalized email template. So setting this up is going to give me when someone reaches this action in this step, it's going to give, you know, me or whoever on my team a task and, you know, X amount of days that it's due, but it's going to link that email template. So all I have to do is open that task, make any changes I want, add any extra info I know about that donor, or, you know, about that type of communication. So you can customize before it sends. Again, that's going to be every donor that hits that action in that step in that workflow will give you a task. So it's kind of a, a, decision you have to make as far as what would be the most efficient. Would you rather have an email 
that you are absolutely setting up to be structured for a specific donor? Or do you want to take a look at that email every time it's going to go out and kind of take away a little bit of the automation? There's definitely a pro and a con for both. You know, it really just depends on the type of workflow. But that's a really great question to me. Mm-hmm. So I, I did pull up the, uh, the template from the new donor welcome series. And you'll see that true to its name, when we have a step for a first time donor where the criteria is simple, it's, you know, their gift, oh, let me see if that'll reload. Their gift is, their gift count, excuse me, is, you know, one gift, it's mm-hmm. pretty obvious criteria. What are the things we're doing? There's a whole host of actions here. Whereas a recurring ask or a second gift, we're just doing some kind of maintenance, a little bit of internal um, kind of database maintenance where we're removing some tag and things like that. So there's all kinds of different actions, but we'll just take a quick, quick look through here. The first time automation runs and someone meets this criteria of a, their gift is one, we're adding a tag, we're adding a couple tags, we're sending this email that's going to be pulling in those merge fields. So we're sending them a, a personalized email, but with the overall structure. Internally, someone on our team is getting a task to give them a call. If we've got letters on demand, we're using a, a welcome postcard to go out. So we're, we're touching them with an email immediately, a call in a few days, and a postcard in a few days. So that way we're hitting them with that multi-channel. From there, we start learning what they like, how they respond to these three interactions. The delays are what help you control the pace that someone moves through this workflow. Remember, automation runs every day. So you set up the delays to say, when do you want them to move on to the next action? If it's not, you know, every day you want a new action. There's a lot of these kind of touch points in these emails. And with each of these emails, we could be learning something different about this donor. And at any point in this step, this workflow step, someone could give. Doesn't mean they get to the bottom and that's when magically all of the second gifts appear. It really depends on you, on your mission, on your messaging, on the donor. But at any point, they can become a second gift donor or second time donor. But it really comes down to just structuring. If someone is going to get all of these interactions, all of these touch points, what do we want the next step to be? That's the biggest question you can ask yourself in automation is what should happen next? Now, I apologize. I I see a few Q and A's coming in. See. Michelle, let me see, let me see. Ooh, it's a great question about project and campaign. That might be a a topic for another time, but the quick kind of answer for that is all giving has a project and a campaign. Giving comes from somewhere and goes to something. A campaign is the cause of a gift, where it's coming from, what was the messaging, perhaps You've got a a campaign segment in each of these emails to say, what's the messaging that spurred someone to give? What was the channel? What was the method? What was the type of ask? The campaign is the cause, where the gift is coming from. And a project is the purpose. What is that money designated for? And for a lot of these kind of first time donors, especially as you're learning about them, engaging in the way donors are giving is actually a really cool thing to do. Someone is giving to a specific project. Do you have other projects like that? Can you maybe encourage them to give to something similar? Maybe that project and your conversation with them and how they gave that first time, you can chat about why they were encouraged to give to that project, the purpose of that money. So it's really the campaign is the start of the gift. Where did it come from? The project is the purpose of the gift. Where is it going? But that's a cool conversation to have with them, to look at their campaign and their project on a gift and say, I see you gave through X campaign and I see you gave towards X project. Tell me more. What do you love about that? 
How did you hear about us? Things like that. So that's kind of a cool conversation to have early on with a donor. So you start to learn about what makes them tick. Now I want to pause there really quick because I know we're at time. Um, and Megan, I feel like we say this every week, but oh gosh, three minutes is <laughs> it's just getting started. <laughs> so quickly. I saw we had a couple of very quick questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps if we want to stick on for a couple of minutes to answer those. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm just pulling up really quick. And sure. Uh, we had, if you don't put in the delay or a due date in an, in a workflow, will the tasks be assigned a day at a time? Tiffany asks. No. So there are going to be, um, you have to put in the due date. So when you're setting a task, you're really assigning, you know, not that I want it due on Thursday, but if this automation is running and, and um, assigning a task, I want, and it happens to be Thursday, for example, I want that to be due, you know, seven days from there. So I want someone to have a task that's assigned on Thursday and do the next Thursday. So you're just setting the pace of that. And so that's just part of building the workflow is deciding on the pace. Correct. Correct. And you can do that per action as far as, um, tasks or not tasks, excuse me, delays go. So not all delays have to be the same, you know, one day or something like that. Um, you can actually structure it. So you're controlling the overall kind of pace. Great. And then Trisha had a question about uh, the first time donor tag. Does it automatically get added or do you manly, manually have to set it up that that's what you want to have happen when someone gives a first gift? It's a great question. So that's actually the very first kind of action within the workflow. So when Virtuous runs automation overnight um, and it says, oh, this person now has a gift. They've got one gift in there. We said our criteria was their gift count of one. The very first action on that workflow was add a tag. So Virtuous is going to run automation, see that that donor meets that criteria. And the very first thing it does is stamp that tag on there. So you're not doing it manually. So that's the kind of nice part. It's that kind of back office administration piece that Virtuous is doing through automation. And I want to pause really quick, just so if, if peeps do need to hop off and, and, you know, they don't have a question, I do want to just really quickly say next Thursday, we are meeting and we're actually chatting for the Virtuous Insider with Jason Van Lu, our director of product, where we're going to take a look at some uh, new features. We have a release coming out next week, um, and we're going to just kind of chat a little bit about just Virtuous and, and the structure of it and kind of what's what's ahead. So here's your, your invitation to our product pull session next Thursday. It will be so much fun. There are some things that I think are super cool. Yeah. It's going to be great. So sorry. Okay. We can get back to questions. I just wanted to, I think we covered everything. Okay, cool. Awesome. And remember you guys can always utilize um, our great, great support team inside of Virtuous up at the top, right? There's a little mortar board. You can always reach out to us. Uh, there's a contact us button there in that drop down that gets you to our support team or on the bottom, right? You will get that little pop-up where you can actually send a message into our support team. And if you have a question, they can always, you know, direct you towards an answer, help you out a little bit, or you can always, always utilize our support documents. I uh, write a lot of them myself, so I think they're pretty helpful, uh, but we encourage you to just kind of poke around. And if you have any questions, let us know. We're always here to help. All right. I will. Uh, Say, have a wonderful rest of your guys' day. Um, and I will leave you with a quote. Uh, Scott always says he likes to leave you with a quote by someone smarter than him. So here's a quote by someone smarter than Scott. <laughs> Walt Disney has said, do what you do so well that they will want to see it again and bring their friends. So really, you know, honor your mission, but do it in a way that encourages your donors to stick around and bring others. All right, everybody, happy Thursday to you all, okay? Bye, everybody. Bye, Megan. Bye, Stephanie.